I think maybe we should just start actually because it is yeah. two. So, uh, Chrissy, I think you're recording. So I'll start now. So um, it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Judge Paolo Pinto de Albuquerque, who stood down as the judge elected in respect of Portugal in March. Um, judge Pinto Paolo, if I may, has been a really great friend to Middlesex University. Uh, he's lectured at our campus in London, examined doctoral theses, and also hosted our students on our annual study trip to Strasbourg. In fact, I remember, I shouldn't remind you of it really, Paolo, one time you met us despite having terrible toothache, but so hospitable were you that we went ahead anyway. <laughs> so um, now, Paolo, of course, needs no introduction uh, in respect of the thing that he's perhaps best known for, his prolific separate opinions, both concurring and dissenting, which have been such a cornucopia really for lawyers, students, um, those who follow the European Court of Human Rights and have made such a huge contribution both to the, the court's case law and also the cause of human rights more generally. And you alerted me before, Paolo, to the fact that your separate opinions now have their own Wikipedia page in French. And uh, I think you've thrown down a challenge to English language mm -hmm. students and scholars to replicate this in English. And I, I'm sure our session today will provide plenty of uh, inspiration to do that. Um, so um, I want to press on because we only have about an hour. Um, before I start, I have one question of my own for you, which is how is life after the court? <laughs> um, it's pretty attractive, I would say, um, because um, uh, clients have, have, have um, expressed interest in my, in my work, uh, so I have, I have uh, a great demand on, on in terms of uh, legal opinions. So it's great. It's a, it's an it's another a different facet of of the same kind of work because I'm I'm still dealing um, in the vast majority of, of cases that I, I've been working on uh, in this new life uh, with uh, human rights issues um, related mainly to criminal procedure. So this is uh, the, the, the domain where I'm very busy right now. And in fact, I'm, I'm having a, a client uh, after this, this webinar, after this um, uh, session. Um, it's it's uh, it's different. It's of course different, but but uh, I, I I I I face this new phase of my life, this new stage of my life, uh, with the same passion that I had um, uh, in in Strasbourg. So it's it's um, it's the same motivation to. Uh, to do uh, as much as I can for for social justice and and for the most vulnerable. Thank you, Paolo. I, I'm sure nobody is surprised to hear that. Um, just a quick word on how we'll run the webinar. Um, we've had quite a few questions emailed in beforehand, and I'll get through as many of those as we can. And those of you who are participating, welcome to you all. Um, you can use the Q and A function um, within Zoom to pose kind of live questions and I'll keep an eye out for those. And I will apologize in advance to any of those questions or indeed the emailed ones that we don't get around to. Um, Bill, would you like to say a few words before we get going? I'll be very brief too. I want to welcome uh, Judge Pinto Dalbecker for coming and doing this with us. Uh, something I've become very acutely aware of in uh, recent months during the lockdown as a consequence of my research on the issue of customary law of human rights, which many of the students here will know I, I'm a bit obsessed with, I've been working on and preparing a study, is how important the contributions of uh, these uh, separate and dissenting opinions is. Uh, if one scours the case law of the European Court of Human Rights and of the Commission, um, there are all, only very, very, very rare references to customary international law, and those are generally in the area of ancillary issues like immunities and so on. And pretty much the only judge 
who has ever ventured onto the terrain of the content of customer international law is our guest today. And there are many, many references uh, to it in a range of, of areas. So in terms of judicial pronouncements, this is the biggest source that exists on customer international law. I just want to say how grateful I am uh, for doing it. Thank you, Bill. I'm sure we'll be mining some of these separate opinions um, today. So I'm going to start, if I may, with one of the emailed questions. Um, this is from Dariana Gryaznova, who's a human rights lawyer. And she says that in December 2019, of course, the Dutch Supreme Court held that the Netherlands has a positive obligation under the convention to mitigate climate change, the, the agenda case. In your opinion, she asks, would the European Court agree with the Dutch Supreme Court's interpretation of Articles 2 and 8 of the Convention, the right to life, of course, the right to respect for private and family life? To what extent will applicants be able to rely on the court in their climate change litigation against other member states? And in general, how do you see the prospects for climate change litigation before the Strasbourg Court? Well, I regret to say that I don't expect much development on, on, on this field of law. Uh, I think we are going to enter into a phase of judicial minimalism uh, from Strasbourg. Um, and, and I regret that. Uh, I regret that because this is the court, if you recall, that was in the very front line of um, environmental issues. So you recall certainly or the real Zis versus Turkey, uh, you recall certainly Guerra versus Italy, um, you recall those, those landmark cases which, which indeed were uh, the, 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 uh, the first and probably the, the most important statements in terms of international courts ever made uh, in this field of law. I don't expect due to the uh, circumstances and, and the and the way the court has evolved recently, I don't expect that this uh, area will be further developed. So I don't expect that um, issues related to, to, for instance, to uh, climate change and to dangerous industrial uh, activities uh, or natural disasters, whatever. I don't expect that these issues will, will be um, further dealt with uh, in terms of, of, of pushing forward the, the, the case law. Um, I, and I regret that. I, re I truly regret that. So, so I, don't I don't think that this Dutch case will impact significantly on, on the case law of the court. I, I, think, I think the judges, of course, read the case and are aware of the case, but I don't think that they will be very much um, sensitive to this line of case law. It, it would be really to push very far the case law, mm. which, which I don't think it's the, it's the, the feeling uh, right now. Mm, thank you. That actually links uh, in, so, in some ways to, to the next question uh, in terms of instances where you have wanted to, as it were, push beyond what the majority was ready for. So this is a question from Konstantin uh, Kodjukario, who is a lawyer with the European Human Rights Advocacy Centre here at Middlesex. Um, his question is about the case of the Centre for Legal Resources on behalf of Valentin Campiano versus Romania. Just to recall the context of that case, this was about a young man who had uh, learning disabilities, was HIV positive, and he died in a Romanian institution after appalling neglect. Uh, one of the key features of the case is that he was represented by an NGO, the Centre for Legal Resources, and in fact, Constantin, our questioner, was involved in the case. Um, and what happened was that the uh, NGO was able to represent uh, was given standing to represent him because his family had abandoned him. There was nobody to take his case. So the question is, uh, recalling your concurring opinion in that case, you deplored the majority's unwillingness to engage in more principled decision-making on the issue of de facto representation and access to justice for people in his position. And you suggested that what you called the majority's casuistic and restricted approach was due to a concern for the pressure of numbers of potential numbers of cases. So six years after Campiano was decided, 
is the court any closer, Constantinas, to providing such extremely vulnerable applicants with fair access to proceedings? Or has this pressure of number arguments prevailed um, as signaled by approaches that paint such vulnerability as an exceptional circumstance to be dealt with on a kind of charitable or discretionary basis? Uh, I think, unfortunately, the court is not is not willing to engage in this uh, on, on this principled uh, uh, reading of the convention. The, the the case law is more and more casuistic, and and um, and by 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 going down this road, of course, it, it, uh, the risk of uh, arbitrary uh, adjudication is increasing because. Um, when you develop this um, casuism, this casuistic approach, you uh, neglect necessarily uh, the principles uh, that um, could uh, enlighten uh, adjudication. So it's, it's, it's a very, I would say, to put it mildly, a very utilitarian uh, um, uh, reading and application of the convention. It's, it's according to the needs of the case uh, and, and, and um, this consequentialist uh, reasoning, of course, does not, does not help uh, the building of a, a structure, um, a coherent, consistent uh, interpretation of the convention. Uh, uh, and this can be seen in the way the court deals, de deals with, uh, with, um, with the issue of uh, extremely vulnerable people. Um, it's, it's, uh, for instance, with the right to health, to health care. Uh, I, 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 I tried to push as much as I could while I was a judge. I brought two cases, to, two Portuguese cases to the Grand Chamber uh, 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 with regard to, to, to the right to health care. Precisely, trying to state clearly uh, in in a in a in a very um, I would say uh, uh, demanding uh, way uh, what should be the framework, the logical principled framework to deal with cases regarding healthcare, uh, and this was the perfect occasion because it was it was a, a grand chamber judgment. It was Fernando de Oliveira. Um, and the, the, the court, the majority, did not want to go this way. Uh, and and, and the, 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 if you read the case, it, it's, it's, in my view, it's a very unfortunate example of, of, of a, a very um, casuistic uh, um, approach of the court, which, which, um, which does not even uh, look up, does not even look for, for, for principles to, to adjudicate. It's, it's, um, it's, it's very unfortunate. And this, I would stress this point, and this, it's not in line with, with the tradition of the court. Uh, it comes from the 60s, from the 70s, this idea that the, 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 the rights uh, enshrined in the convention have a, a, a substance, they have a, a, an essence, and this essence, whatever, whatever the right is, should not be in any event, in any, in any case, should be uh, 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 violated, breached. So it, my, my, my effort was, uh, in these two uh, Portuguese cases that went on to the Grand Chamber and in many others, was always to, tr to try to find this essence of, of the right or the freedom at stake. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm bothered by the fact that um, sometimes the, the court uses this expression that um, uh, um, the concept of, 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 of this, this, this idea of the substance of the right uh, to limit uh, state discretion uh, only in a very rhetorical way, without explicit in, in, in a, an explicit way uh, identifying and defining what is the essence of the right uh, in that particular uh, case, which is at stake in that particular case. 
and 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 um, uh, so I'm 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 very bothered by this this uh, idea that um, the language can can be used um, in such a way. The, the the legal language has a meaning and should should serve a purpose. We cannot use the, the, this language, which is a substantialist, principled language, just to cover, to dissimulate what is really uh, the method, the methodology, uh, methodology uh, of, of the court, which is pretty much casuistic. And then the, the concept uh, of, of, of substance, of core, the core of the right, the, 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 the essence of the right, it's merely rhetorical, it's, it's, it's meaningless. Um, and we have seen that in, in so many cases recently. For instance, cases where the court, uh, for instance, in Regner versus the Czech Republic, the court again refers to the essence of Article 6. But you, you look for the essence, you look for, for, the, for, the, for this concept, what is the essence, what, what, what is really the, the core of the, of, of, the, of the right, and you don't find it anywhere. It's just, it's just a rhetorical instrument. Interesting. Um, uh, and of course, judges, dissenters, of course, pretty much identify this problem, and they criticize this. In that particular case, it was the, the former president himself, Guido Raimondi, uh, with other colleagues, with another former president, uh, Alexander Sicilianos, who wrote separately and said, and they said, no, come on, if you talk about the right. And the problem was that there was no effort made by, by the majority to identify this essence. So, um, uh, uh, again, um, and, and this could be replicated in, in many other examples, uh, where the court, for instance, um, does not separate clearly between the proportionality test and the, the essence test. The, 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 uh, the court mixes the two things while, while they are totally separated. Uh, the, the constitutional and Supreme Courts all over Europe, they have said it repeatedly. They, these two tests have nothing to do with, uh, they, have, with they are totally separated, uh, one from the other. It, it, and yet the court, uh, sometimes says, well, we do the balancing, and at the end of the balancing, we conclude that the balancing was, was, um, was favorable to, to, the, to, the, uh, to the respondent government, and therefore the essence of the right was respected. This is a totally misunderstanding of what the essence of the right test is about. As, as President Costa himself said, I think we're having a few connectivity problems there. Hopefully, Paolo will come back in a second. Paolo, I think you've frozen temporarily, hopefully only for a short while. Bill, while we're waiting, I don't know if you have any thoughts about this question Paolo raised about the essence of the right and the ill-defined nature of that. Mm. I don't know that I can say anything. I don't, I don't think I can add anything useful to what he said. Maybe others want to, can we call on others or? Um, I think everybody else is, is muted. Uh, um, our left, hopefully he'll rejoin us um, in a second if we just bear with that. Um, we can call upon um, any of our participants if you'd like me to make them <laughs> allow, um, yeah, which is called allowed to talk. <laughs> if anybody does want to um, get involved, let me know um, with the chat, and I will I will um, give you that function to be allowed to talk. Great. How will we recover him? Um, I'm hoping he will dial back in again. I think there was obviously a communications glitch. So if I. Participants could just bear with us, hopefully, just for a minute or two while we get him back. The beauty of the online world is 
being able to bring in people in Portugal that wouldn't normally have time to come to London, but this is the downside, I suppose. But uh, if our participants would like to think of any questions they have. Oh, Damian uh, on the chat is saying he'd like to make a point about this question of the essence of a right. We see if you could unmute Damian. Hi there. Hi, Damian. Hi. Well, I think that's an interesting point. I'm just wondering where he's coming from. So what is the essence of rights? How do you interpret rights if you assume they have the essence and where does that essence end, basically? That is my question. I think that would be a little bit interesting to discuss because it reminds me very much of Hart's idea of uh, core and penumbra in interpretation, basically. There's a clear core and there's a penumbra of uncertainty and I'm wondering if that's what he has in mind when he's talking about the essence of a right. That there's a clear essence and all the, all the rest is left interpretation. I'm not sure, uh, I'm sorry. but it would be interesting. I'm not sorry. We have Judge Pinto back again. Hi, Paolo, can you hear us okay? Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Great, no worries, no, it was just a communications glitch yeah. there. So, um, no. did you yeah, want to yeah, finish please, off please. that point you were making? No, I, um, it's just my my worry with my worries with with the uh, with the, uh, this this um, lack of a principled approach to to the to the to the convention and 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 um, also to, the, to this other issue um, that uh, the court avoids um, engaging with any. Um, discussion of the substance of the essence of the rights and freedoms enshrined in the convention and, and um, uh, although although this although this um, concept is there in the case law for ages since the 60s uh, it started with with the uh, I did a, a research and in fact it started with the the, the, the linguistic case against Belgium and then in Golder again we talk about uh, the substance of the right um, uh, there are many cases where the court talks about the, the substance. Either the language is a bit is a bit uh, um, uncertain. Uh, the language used by the court sometimes it talks about the the essence, sometimes about the very essence, sometimes about the substance or the very substance, the core of the right. So it uses different concepts, but mainly. Uh, the idea is that there is a, a core uh, which 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 should not be interfered with, um, and this not only with regard to civil and political rights, but also uh, with with um, uh, equality rights and 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 uh, social rights. Uh, those that are that are um, or can be derived from from the convention and, and and protocols, and and there is a huge amount of case law where this. Um, uh, concept is, is there, but uh, in the vast majority of the cases, the court does not really engage with, uh, uh, um, does not make the effort of, of defining what is this concept, what is this uh, essence. Um, and this because the court ties its hands with, with a very casuistic uh, reading of, 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 of the convention. Mm. Interesting. I think this could be a fascinating PhD topic for somebody. Um, but if I may, I'll move on to the next question. This is from another colleague at the European Human Rights Advocacy Centre, uh, Ramute um, Ramazai. She says, can you please comment on the court's sometimes vaguely worded position with regards to the applicability of Article 18 with articles other than Article 5, the right to liberty? For example, she says in a recent case where the applicant raised a violation of Article 18, in conjunction this time with articles eight and 10, right to family life, private and family life, and right to free expression, in relation to his disbarment as a lawyer, the court concluded that the court is not in a position to examine this complaint separately in the particular circumstances of the case without any further elaboration as to why it was not in a position to do so. 
Um, the court did find violations of Article 8 and 10 in this case. I think she's referring to Bagirov versus Azerbaijan from just a couple of weeks ago. But I wondered if you could just then reflect on that question about the applicability of Article 18 with articles other than Article 5. Article 18 is normally referred to in cases that are politically charged. So it's a very, very, um, how should I put it, problematic provision of the convention and its applicability raises not only legal but also political issues. So the court refrains, and this is a, posi a position of prudence, refrains from using or overusing this, this, this article. Um, and uses this, uh, this expression that it is not necessary um, in view of what has already been decided, it is not necessary to uh, go on with, with the discussion of, of, this, of this article. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a balance that the court tries to find between um, uh, reproaching the state when it, there's a need to reproach the state finding violations um, and not going too far so that the, the state uh, does not feel that there is some kind of, um, uh, how should I put it, political consideration motivating the judges. So um, it's, it's, it's a rather difficult issue and, and, and um, it's an issue, I should say, that um, regards uh, judicial diplomacy. In many instances, um, the court did not um, go down the road of, of a, a true discussion of, of, uh, of this article and the, the, the invoked violation only for diplomatic reasons, because, because it was a case where the judges felt that um, uh, a, a, an additional violation on the basis of Article 18 would damage, at the end, would damage the message of the court, the message that the court would, would like to send to the Ah, oh dear, we've frozen again. Just give it a few seconds to see if that resolves itself. It's a shame. Oh dear. I would think we're going to have to just bear with this for a bit and hope that um, Paolo can dial back in again. Um, I've got a comment come through from uh, one of our PhD students, Andreas. Hi there. Um, he says it's great that we have Judge Pinto de Albuquerque here, the um, PhD student working under, of course, Bill's supervision. And he has a question regarding the doctrine of evolutive interpretation employed in many occasions by the court. So I better wait till uh, Paolo's back with us to read out the question in full. But thank you for that, Andreas. Others are welcome also to use the Q&A function to put additional points. We have quite a store of questions waiting. Um, A uh, question from Joelle Grogan, a colleague as well. This is a great talk. Could I ask you if you think Judge Pinto is correct on the role of the court in this context? I presume that means the um, Article 18 issue. Do you have any thought? Ah, we have him yeah. back. Excellent. Sorry. No, no worries at all. That's fine. Um, we, uh, should we move on to the next question or did you want no. to finish off yeah. what you were saying? Um, this is a slightly broader one from anne Catherine Speck, who's a doctoral researcher at the University of Ghent. Um, she's interested in the evidentiary regime developed by the court. And she says, during your time at the court, what aspect of the court's treatment of evidence, whether at the admissibility stage, during the non-contentious phase, at the merits or just satisfaction stages, 
um, have you found to be the most problematic or potentially problematic in relation to the court's treatment of evidence? And actually, I will just add on to that another question from our colleague Phil Leach from ARAC. Is there a future for European court fact-finding hearings? Yeah, absolutely. These two questions are intimately related one to the other. Uh, and and um, this is an issue that has always bothered me a lot. Um, uh, because although the court, of course, is uh, a law court, not a facts court, should, should uh, deal mainly, and, and, and this is the task of a Supreme Court in Europe, uh, to deal with, with issues of, of legal nature, not factual nature. Uh, the truth is that um, the court is uh, very frequently confronted with issues that are strictly factual. Um, and require an analysis of, 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 the, um, of the evidence before the court, put forward bef by the parties before the court. Um, uh, and um, what I felt when I came to the court being a judge, because my background is judicial, is that there are no clear clear cut rules on, 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 on uh, on evidence, on, on evidentiary assessment and evaluation uh, by, by, by the court. Um, the court has this very broad rule that um, there is no fourth instance. So the court should, in principle, not discuss issues of uh, factual nature. But then there are certain exceptions. And if you go on and, and try to delve into the details of, of these exceptions, it's very discretionary, very, very discretionary. So the, the, the practice of the court, I think it's, it, it, it deserves reflection. Um, and and, um, and, and uh, I would say that um, uh, there is here a lot of work to be done um, uh, to, to try to, uh, uh, from, from the case law to try to isolate and, and, and draw from the case law uh, certain rules uh, on evidence, evidentiary rules uh, that are uh, applicable uh, and could be eventually enshrined in the, in the, in the, in the rules uh, um, of the court, this is a task that has still to be done. It's still to be done. And, and I try to do this um, uh, with regard to um, uh, criminal law, so the, the field of criminal law, which is which is specific, so it requires a specific uh, a attention and specific rules, um, evidentiary rules, and and I tried to do this because I, I started a group um, uh, within the court, uh, the criminal law group, uh, so it was a kind of a reflection group which was supposed to. Uh, to do two things. First, to, um, uh, to create a dictionary, a kind of a dictionary on uh, the most important legal concepts used by the court in this field of law, so criminal law, so that the, all sections would have the same language and use the same concepts with the same meaning. We did that. It's not public, but we did that. It's, it's, a, it's a work that has been done on the basis of similar work that has been done, for instance, at the ICC um, yeah, and, 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 and other uh, international um, courts. The, the European Court of Justice also did that. Um, uh, the other issue that, that uh, we worked um, on was exactly this point of the evidentiary rules. Uh, and we, try, we tried to, um, uh, to come to very abstract rules that could be uh, used uh, in, in, in as many cases as possible when we were confronted, uh, would be confronted with issues of factual nature. But it was extremely difficult. It was extremely difficult because of the different backgrounds of the colleagues, uh, the, um, uh, the, the way we, uh, each one of us interprets the, the, the case law, it was extremely difficult to, to, to come to these principles. Um, uh, and uh, even with regard to documentary evidence, so documents, which is probably easier than, than 
testimonies, than the assessment of testimonies. Um, uh, we, we could not we could not find uh, easily a, a middle ground and 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 um, uh, this work was was is ongoing I hope uh, other colleagues who succeeded me um, um, uh, are I hope ah, oh dear this seems to happen every few minutes isn't it um... At the critical moment, just when we're waiting for something. Yes, exactly. Yes. Not a shame. Just wait for him to reconnect. Thanks for bearing with us, everybody. Um, it's a shame we're having these problems. Um, I'll come to uh, Andreas's question next that you put in on the Q and A about the doctrine of evolutive interpretation. I should add for those that were interested in the, the question that Anne posed about the evidentiary regime that uh, this is the start of a, a big research project based at the University of Ghent which is looking into this very issue so I'm sure that they will be in touch with Paolo. Yeah. Hi Paolo you're back. Great. I've used this uh, uh, two weeks ago with, with Oxford and it went quite, quite well and now yeah, it's not... not to worry, we're happy to bear with it. Thank you for your patience as well. Um, I was just saying to the others that um, I, I know that Anne asked this question in the context of um, she's involved at the very beginning of a big research project at the University of Ghent on the court's evidentiary regime. So I expect you'll be getting a call from them to take this further. Um, I'm going to just, just to begin the time, move, move on to the next question, which has been put up on the Q&A by Andreas Charakis, who's a PhD student with us at Middlesex, um, uh, under indeed Bill's supervision. And he says, my question is regarding the doctrine of, of evolutive interpretation employed on many occasions by the court, this idea of the, of the convention as a living instrument and so on. In particular, he says, I'd like to have your thoughts on the bearers of human rights obligations and how the convention has evolved to bring other actors into the game. Moreover, on what grounds can we observe an evolution in cr crimes, de the defin definition of crimes and the impact of Article 7 of the, co of the convention? I don't, I don't know if I, I, I understood the, the, the question. Um, you, you, could, you, could you repeat the last yes. part? Of course. So he says he'd like to have your thoughts on on the bearers of human rights obligations and how the convention has evolved to bring other, I assume he means non-state actors into the game. And uh, the last bit reads, on what grounds can we observe an evolution? I think he means in the definition of crimes and the impact of Article 7 of the convention. But maybe, maybe you could at least address the first part in terms of yeah. non-state actors. Yeah. Um, well, um, my main uh, concern when I dealt with this type of cases, um, uh, Article 7 cases and, and um, um, positive obligations that could be derived from Article 7, um, uh, it's, 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 it was always uh, to, to try to get the big picture. Um, in the Ilmsia case against Germany, um, the, the court was confronted with the legal question of um, what, what, what is the, the obligation, the state obligation with regard to mentally uh, disturbed uh, prisoners, uh, and, and whether this, this concept of mental illness could impact on the application of Article 7. And this due to the fact that the, the, the Federal Constitutional Court of Germany had a very particular interpretation of this concept. Um, what, what the majority said was quite disturbing in my view. Uh, the majority basically gave the states um, and particularly the prison administration 
a blank check. Um, this is quite disturbing because because it's it's um, um, it's it departs totally from what we have said in the past. The, this this judgment, uh, uh, which which mainly demolishes, in my view, uh, decades of case law referring to Article Seven. Um, uh, it, it's, it's if we build, we, if we start now to build case law on this on this precedent, it, it's going to be terrible. I think, in, in my view, it's going to be uh, quite problematic from from uh, from the perspective of um, of a criminal lawyer. It's it's quite disturbing because the the principle of legality will serve no real purpose, and 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 uh, um, and all the good things that we derive from Article 7 and the, and the principle of legality, not only with regard to the state, but also to uh, uh, non-state actors, um, it's, it's in question now. It's, it's really very disturbing. If you bring to this big picture the, 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 the issues related to interstate cases, um, the issues related to um, um, war and, and uh, international armed conflicts, which are now on the table um, at the court, um, starting with, with, uh, with uh, Ukraine versus uh, Russia, Georgia versus Russia, uh, it's, it's quite worrying. Um, I think um, the, the court has, has to go back to, to, to its roots and, and uh, if we now will read, from now on, we'll read Article 7 from the, with the lens of, 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 this, uh, of this Ion Zea case, it's going to be, in my view, a very bad service that we do to, the, to, the, to, to Europe and, and to... to uh, Dear. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we might give it one, one more go to get Paolo back because we have to finish in about 15 minutes, but it's probably worth uh, waiting for him to reconnect one more time. This seems to be a cyclical problem that happens every few minutes. Ah, oh, you're back. Yeah, you, you froze just for about 30 seconds uh -huh. there. <laughs> Actually, if I can just speak in, a, you mentioned there the issue of armed conflict, and I'll, there's one more question we had from my colleague. Philip Leach, who's getting more than his fair share of questions, but it is directly related. Can and should the court continue to adjudicate on course cases arising from armed conflict, whether international or non-international interstate cases or individual applications? Well, this is one, uh, one, one legal question that has been put and will be discussed in a, in, a, in a case that is pending. And I'm a member of the composition in this case. It's Georgia versus Russia. Um, so I'm not going to disclose uh, the discussion, but uh, what I can tell you is my opinion as a, as a, uh, uh, um, an interpreter of the convention, and this opinion has, has been uh, made explicit in other uh, um, cases, pr previous cases that, uh, that um, I was uh, dealing with. Um, and my opinion is that the court should indeed uh, deal with these type of cases. Um, and, and the reason for that is that the court has stated um, in, in several uh, instances that um, there is jurisdiction uh, when a, a state um, kills someone, for instance, uh, outside of its borders, um, targets someone um, kidnaps someone outside of, it, uh, of its borders. The state is responsible for, for that uh, um, killing, for that action. Uh, my question is very simple. If the state has, has, has been made responsible in light of, of, of this case law, uh, when there is one single person targeted, why not to have jurisdiction and to make this state responsible when there are not only one or two or three people targeted but hundreds thousands of people when you launch a missile 
to the to the territory of, of another state, and this missile kills hundreds of people. Uh, how can you say that there is no jurisdiction, um, and yet at the same time um, maintain the case law um, that we have delivered, um, for instance, against Turkey, that um, uh, extraterritorial acts targeting single persons um, are a basis for jurisdiction. The state is responsible for these for these um, extraterritorial uh, acts. So um, my point is that um, uh, in line with the previous case law and to keep in line with that, to be coherent with that, uh, I think the, the court should deal with these issues of conflicts, um, armed conflicts in Europe. Um, otherwise the, the victims will be powerless, will be totally powerless. They, they will have no legal avenue because they cannot, of course, come to uh, the, the, the judicial system of, of the aggressor. They cannot use the judicial system for obvious reasons uh, of the aggressor. Um, someone uh, um, in Ukraine cannot come to Russia to, 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 to plead this case or a case um, um, for obvious reasons. And, and, and so the, the court remains the legal uh, avenue that is available to, to victims in these type of cases. It, and, and the sole incredible uh, uh, legal avenue. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to try and fit a couple more in. One, one question has been sent through by one of our participant, participants, Natia, thank you. Um, she says, in the case of Babiats versus Poland, forgive my pronunciation, uh, concerning the applicant's inability to obtain a divorce from his wife without her consent, you dissented from the majority decision and you deem that a proper balance was not struck or had not been struck between the interests involved from the perspective of Article 8. As concerns Article 12, the right to marry, you noted that the Convention does not protect the right to terminate a marriage on demand and that the prohibition on divorce may be an admissible restriction on, to the right to remarry if it is couched in clear terms and applied in a proportionate way. So Natia's question is, would you have introduced this same dissenting opinion had the court not been, um, as she puts it, struggling with the principle of subsidiarity and the backlash over its expansive approach, etc. Put simply, she asks, what is your current opinion on the right to divorce from the perspective of the Convention and in general? I would stick to my opinion. I think, I think there is an issue with subsidiarity in that, in that uh, majority judgment. Uh, basically, the majority felt that um, it could be much easier to deal with the case by using this argument and, and to rely on the national court's judgments on the basis of subsidiarity. And in view of the nature of the issue that was at stake, the right to remarry, uh, they, they thought it wise that um, this should be ultimately decided by the national authorities because they had a feeling, they had the gut feeling of what was adequate, more adequate in the, in the Polish society. I don't agree with that at all. I think, I think there's a, 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 a provision, again, there's... Ah. <laughs> again, cut off at the crucial moment. Let's just give it a few seconds. a shame we still have uh, about yeah, i can hear you i can hear yeah, you can okay we were frozen 20 seconds maybe i it's it's amazing because i can hear you i cannot oh, hear everything that you that's say strange yeah you you were just frozen but just you but you but frozen. you but you cannot hear me no not not for 20 seconds or so but no. uh if, if you Very can re regain, regain your thread please continue <laughs> um as I was saying, I think, I think um, this article, uh, as, as all articles of, 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 of the substantive part of the convention, they have the substance, they have their essence. The duty of the judge is to find uh, the, the substance of, of, of the article, uh, of the right uh, 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 year. That's what I tried to, to do with, with, with the separate opinion. Uh, I would stick to it. I, I don't think of course, there is, there is, this is a, 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 a right that needs to be regulated and the state authorities 
do need a margin of appreciation and discretion while regulating this, uh, this, this right. It's obvious, this, this is a platitude, huh? it's a la palisade, there's nothing new about that. The problem is that uh, the way, the very formalistic way that the, the, the Polish courts dealt with this case was, was in my view, not acceptable. Uh, and and the, the response of the court uh, putting the emphasis on, on, on subsidiarity, just relying on, on, on subsidiarity to deal with the case, it's, it's the way of not solving the case, really. It's a way of, of uh, getting rid of the case and, and, and uh, simply, simply um, uh, rubber stamping the, 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 the decision of, of the national courts. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Time for just a couple more quick questions, I think. Um, this one's from Joe Evans. Oh, and again, Philip Leach from ERAC. Is the court right only to refer in its judgments to individuals involved in cases by their initials, such as implicated police officers? Or does the establishment of the facts and the right to truth require implicated public officials to be named in full? Well, I was always in favor of maximum transparency, always. Uh, but I understand uh, the worries of some colleagues with regard to uh, privacy and especially privacy of, of applicants. Um, and, and of course, this is a rule that must be kept and, and respected. Uh, with regard to offenders um, and specifically to police officers, um, the practice of the court is not always coherent. Sometimes uh, the, 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 the persons are identified. Some, in other cases, there is no identification. Um, I, think, I think it's a duty of the court to identify. Uh, there's, there's a, when we talk about, of course, when we talk about convicted offenders, when there is a convicted offender, uh, I'm talking about convicted offenders. If, if the person has not yet been convicted, then the presumption of innocence works. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, in that case, um, uh, uh, we should keep these persons anonymous uh, and, and the use of initials is, is required. But when we talk about convicted offenders, then I see no reason why, why not to use the, the, the full name. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and then I think this might be the last one. Uh, we're just in time. Um, this is from uh, Margarita Ilieva, um, a lawyer with ERAC, and she asks, what possible new role do you see for the court, if any, where a government fails to implement successive judgments on the same issue or set of issues due to lack of political will, and the Committee of Ministers machinery is ineffective? So she says, do you have any other ideas beyond the court's possible role about how to address systemic non-implementation using the range of Council of Europe tools? This is the most important issue regarding the future of the court, in my view. Systemic um, uh, misapplication or disapplication or non-application or non-implementation of the judgment of the court, it's, the, it's, a, it's an issue of credibility. If we allow this to go on, if politicians allow this to go on, of course the court will face uh, uh, um, an enormous um, uh, lack of credibility. Uh, it's, 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 um, I, I think an, an issue that should should be a, a major concern on the agenda of, of, um, of politicians who care for Europe, who care for the Council of Europe, who care for the court, and of course for uh, for all of us, uh, lawyers and, and, and people uh, who are who are uh, involved and working in one way or another. Uh, Paolo, if you can hear me, you're frozen again, hopefully just for a few seconds. So, uh, ah, you're back now, Paolo. Yeah, you froze just for 10 can you hear me? seconds. Now we can. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, it's it's uh, the quality of the internet. I don't know. Maybe the, the, this place is not is not good. I should have. Yeah, not to worry. Not to worry. You you, you were just saying that the, the credibility of the convention system is at stake in terms of this non-implementation, particularly of these systemic 
judgments yeah, related to systemic my, 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 yeah, my, 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 my uh, advice would be to uh, refer more cases for the Committee of Ministers to refer more cases uh, and Article 46 for to the court. Um, and and um, this is the only way, the only legal way to, but, but of course this require, requires a lot of political maneuvering because we need the two thirds um, at, the, at the Committee of Ministers. Uh, other than this, I think the only possible way of, of, of is to put pressure on the states, to, to, to put political pressure uh, and 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 this, of course, is is also uh, something that we um, people in the universities, um, lawyers, uh, the lawyers bar all over the, the Europe should do and and are able to do. Um, they they can, of course, they can, of course, um, uh, uh, criticize the states for not implementing their their their. their um, most important judgments. Um, uh, for instance, the Portuguese Lawyers Bar Association has done that, uh, and quite efficiently, I would say. They they had put some pressure on on, on the government, and the government, uh, in order to um, to 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 reply to to to, to the lawyers, um, uh, started to do something. Things started to move on. Uh, and this could be replicated. Uh, I know that, that, for instance, in Spain, there's, there's also the same uh, um, uh, way uh, lawyers put enormous pressure on, on the government to, to, to get things done, uh, to get the, the judgments of the European Court implemented. Um, uh, in Italy also, I have many, many friends in Italy, they, they, they are updating me on, on the implementation of Italian cases, and these mostly, these cases are implemented due to pressure from the universities, from the lawyers bar association, which is which is um, ultimately what what pushes the governments to do something. So, it, other than the the, the infringement um, actions uh, under Article Forty Six Four, I think political pressure it's it's um, it's the only uh, way to to get things uh, uh, moving. Mm. Thank you for that. Yeah, you, um, you, I'm sure, are aware, and others may wish to know um, in that respect about the European Implementation Network, which is an NGO based in Strasbourg, which is seeking to coordinate through domestic actors, particularly civil society actors and national human rights institutions, that very pressure um, and also facilitate access of civil society to the Strasbourg system in terms of making submissions to the Committee of Ministers and so on. Um, I think we'd better leave it there because we are, uh, our, our hour is up. Um, we had one more question. I apologise to you, Sergei, you sent a question in rather late, which I don't think we have time to cover. But so it just remains for me to thank you, Paolo, very much for joining us. Thank you and everybody for bearing uh, with some technical I'm problems. Sorry, I'm there. sorry for the difficulties with the connection, with the internet connection. I, sh I should have gone to my place. Which, no problem. Uh, you, your voice connection. came through loud and loud and clear. So we're, yeah. we're so grateful to you. Yeah. And we, of course, want to keep Middlesex's connection with you going in your, in your life after the court. Bill, do you want to have it's a final better. word? No, just to say. Thank you, I'm sure. So uh, thank you also to all our participants. I think this session has been recorded, so will be available for you to, to listen back to if you want to, and please circulate that recording to others as well. Um, apologies to Sergei and other, any others we didn't get around to um, having your questions. They can send the questions, the, the, uh, you can give them the, 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 my email and they can send them. Okay, the well that's very kind of you, I'll pass that on, all right. So, but again, thank you so much, Paolo, thank, thank you. you, and um, we, we look forward to being reunited again soon. Thank you. Bye everybody.